This video is sponsored by Masterworks. Vulcanized rubber is a product so universally used that we hardly ever think about it. Yet without it, our modern world would hardly be the same. Surgeons use it to protect their patients from germs. Hikers use it to stay dry in the rain. Cars need it to move forward. Airplanes need it to land. But it's ironic that while today it's used in classrooms and offices the world over to erase mistakes, its very existence came completely by accident. This is Charles Goodyear. You may recognize his name from places like here or here. And no, he's not actually the founder of Goodyear Tire, but without his critical discovery in 1839, rubber as we know today would never have existed. And you know, without rubber, there'd be no tires. So for the name of a tire company, pretty good choice. Goodyear also wasn't the one who actually discovered rubber. We'll dive into that in a second, but Goodyear is responsible for discovering the recipe for making rubber more durable, allowing it to function in a whole bunch of different ways. The craziest part is that he did it completely by accident, working at the Eagle India Rubber Company here in Woburn, Massachusetts. But that's not where this story starts. The story actually starts here in a region known as Mesoamerica, around 3,000 years before Goodyear ever entered the picture. Before we get into it, if you're enjoying this video, please hit that like button. It not only helps the channel a ton, it also lets us know exactly what kind of videos you want to see more of. So in the region stretching between central Mexico all the way down to Honduras and Nicaragua, tribes like the Aztecs, Olmecs, and Mayans discovered a harmonious relationship between two very particular plants. The Ipomea alba, also known as morning glory, and the Castilla elastica tree. The Castilla sap had some very peculiar qualities. It was thick, sticky, and stretchy. Even though it was liquid, it sort of behaved like a solid. What we didn't know was that the sap contained high concentrations of latex proteins, starch, and alkaloids that gave it its high elasticity, meaning that you could stretch it or compress it and it would return to its original shape, and high tensile strength, meaning it didn't rip, tear, or break apart very easily. While these ancient tribes may not have known the deeper science behind the miracle sap, they discovered that by mixing different ratios of Castilla sap and morning glory juice, they could exploit different properties to fit different applications. It turns out the morning glory plant, which grows naturally near Castilla trees, contains elements that kick off critical chemical changes that transform the sap from sticky brittle latex into stretchy elastic. Unprocessed Castilla sap was still used to join different materials together, an early form of glue and primitive rubber joists with shock absorbing properties. Adding in more morning glory juice stabilized the sap, which was great for footwear. Spanish conquistadors described the Aztecs as wearing durable treaded sandals, a few millennia before Nike. The substance was water resistant and could be lathered onto hats and clothing to create a protective barrier. Most famously, these early tribes made the world's first rubber balls. But these weren't like today's soccer balls. They weighed between six and 10 pounds and players used their hips instead of their feet. Also, sometimes the losers were beheaded, but that's neither here nor there. Archaeologists believe that these tribes built entire economies around the substance, which they called caoutchouc, caoutchouc, let's go with caoutchouc, the earliest form of what would eventually become rubber. The Mesoamerican tribes actually had a pretty good thing going. That is until those pesky Europeans showed up and had to ruin everything. One of the earliest European missionaries to write about rubber was Friar Juan de Torquemada in 1615. About a century later, this guy, Charles Marie de la Condamine, is credited as being the first person to introduce rubber to Europe. But it wasn't exactly off to a booming success. Early scientists and entrepreneurs certainly saw potential in this miracle material that was, at the time, renamed gum elastic. It was exceptionally flexible, resistant to many corrosive substances, and it could serve as an excellent electrical insulator. All great things in the industrializing Western world. Before we get back to the show, let me tell you about Masterworks. With Masterworks, you can own fractional shares of iconic art, just like owning a stock in a company. With the world the way it is and concerns over inflation, everyone's looking for a safe place to store their wealth. Masterworks has a unique algorithm that identifies promising art from emerging artists. After holding it for three to 10 years, they sell it for profits on the secondary markets. Did you know that contemporary art has outperformed the S&P 500, gold, and housing over the past 25 years? Using art as a wealth storage tool is nothing new to the very wealthy, but now with Masterworks, it's available to us all. Housing, jobs, and the economy are all connected and fall together, but art doesn't play by the same rules. As more people enter the middle class, the demand for fine art will only increase. Use my link in the description to skip 
the wait list and join masterworks.io to start investing in multi-million dollar artwork today. Huge thanks to Masterworks and to you for supporting the companies that support this show. Okay, time for a mini science lesson, but trust me, this will be fun. So stick with us. So the thing that makes rubber so special is that it has a particular type of molecule called a polymer. Basically a very long molecule made up of these really long chains of repeating materials. These interlocking chains are incredibly strong, much stronger than most other organic substances. So even though the natural sap is a liquid at room temperature, those strong interlocking forces make it behave like a solid. And mixing in different stabilizers, just like the Aztecs did with the Morning Glory juice, can help solidify all those great qualities. One major breakthrough came when English chemist Joseph Priestley noticed that a piece of the material was extremely good at rubbing off pencil marks on paper. We'll never know exactly what Mr. Priestley was trying to cover up, but we can thank him for the fact that today we call it rubber instead of caoutchouc. Get it? Rubber for rubbing off pencil lead. So that's where rubber gets its name from. That's pretty cool. But the application of natural rubber was somewhat limited. While it did have many incredible qualities, it also had a certain number of drawbacks. For one thing, natural rubber doesn't like extreme changes in temperature. When it gets warm, like if it were spinning really fast against a rough paved road, like a tire, it would get extremely sticky and kind of fall apart. On the flip side, if natural rubber gets really cold, it becomes more brittle and prone to shattering, like the evil Terminator and Terminator 2. In hopes of solving this rubber problem, chemists the world over set out to find a solution to help this miracle product reach its full potential. Enter self-taught American chemist, our boy, Charles Goodyear. Around 1831, Goodyear began running his own experiments with gum elastic, a quest that would take him over five years across multiple states. At one point, he was even arrested by creditors for not paying back his debts on his investments and was sent to prison. But his persistence never failed. Even in jail, Goodyear was mixing different materials with rubber. He tried magnesium, turpentine, nitric acid, lead oxide. At one point, he even nearly suffocated himself with noxious gas. And every time he thought he finally cracked the nut, before long, the substance would become sticky again. By 1839, a flustered and exacerbated Goodyear ended up in the Eagle India Rubber Company, where he continued to pursue his obsession. It was here that one fateful night, Goodyear decided to combine his natural rubber with sulfur. During the experiment, Goodyear accidentally dropped his mixture into a hot frying pan. Amazingly though, the mixture didn't melt. Instead, it appeared to harden. As he increased the heat, the rubber got even harder. Inspired by the Roman god Vulcan, god of fire and metallurgy, Goodyear dubbed this breakthrough process Vulcanization. This was the accident that would change the world forever. It was the combination of sulfur and heat that made all the difference. Those two factors allowed the polymer rubber to become what's known as a cross-linked polymer. Basically, the sulfur acts like a little bridgeway between two latex chains. So now instead of having individual chains, you have chains starting to link together. What this means is that all those incredible properties that rubber already had got even better and all those drawbacks virtually disappeared. Now, you had rubber that was significantly stronger while also retaining its elasticity. And it's those two properties that have made vulcanized rubber one of the most significant discoveries of all time. What other material would work as a plane's landing gear? It needs to be insanely strong to support the weight of the plane, sturdy enough not to melt with all that friction, yet still have elasticity to absorb the shock of that very heavy aircraft landing on the ground without shattering to a million pieces. There's only one element that could possibly do the job, and that's vulcanized rubber. Over 50 years after Goodyear stumbled upon this breakthrough discovery, John Dunlap, Dunlap Tires, invented the pneumatic tire. Or did he? Maybe that could be a future Tuba Da Vinci episode. Let us know in the comments below. So in the case of car tires, we did have wooden tires before that. But the problem with wood is it wears really quickly when hitting that ground over and over again. To fix this, people would put a steel belt around the wooden tire to help with the wear. But you can imagine how rough and incredibly uncomfortable those early tires were. Plus, you were limited to about 10 or 15 miles an hour. There's no way you're going 80 miles an hour on such a wheel. So that's where vulcanized rubber completely transformed transportation as we know it. We wouldn't have vehicles and highways and aircraft and landing and all this came from vulcanized rubber. And that doesn't even get into things like shoes, 
How amazing are those? They last for years, give you really good grip on the road, and are just so durable. We take them for granted. Goodyear's story can serve as inspiration to us all that often the most influential ideas don't come from a large research lab or require huge research grants. Sometimes all it takes is determination and perhaps even a little bit of fate. But before we go, we have just enough time for the comment of the week. First up from CJ, this is on our Aptera video where we talked about the Aptera EV. He says, any engineer will tell you that scaling down is almost always a win-win. I agree with you. Good point. And the second one comes from Kevin Hoffman, and this is on our Crescent Dune thermal solar plant video. He says, if they learned anything about it at all, it's a success. And I agree with that. That's a really good point. It actually kind of gets down to the heart of this video as well. Thank you so much. We'll see you guys next week.